want to be the first to announce that next year at the beginning of fall break, we will have a, um, a Panama City service. <laughs> and, you know, the pastor just needs to go where the people are. Just trying to be a good shepherd, so I've put myself up to, to lead that service. Today we finish a seven-week series on our true identity. And hopefully even today it'll sort of bring some things together, if you've been here for the last several weeks, that will put an exclamation point on who God says you are. If you're here for the first time in this series, uh, a special welcome to you, and I think you'll kind of get a sense of who we, who we are, not just as the church at Broadway, but as the church universal and what we believe about why that, why that matters. Uh, and so, welcome. I'm glad you're here. There's a place in your bulletin for notes, and you can uh, sort of take some of those down as, as I go along as we continue to try to discover who we really are. Little Tommy uh, was getting into so much trouble that his mother just sort of had it. She had tried everything that she could think of. Finally, she called up the pastor and asked him to come over and have a talk with her son. Now, this is not a great discipline strategy, by the way. I wouldn't advise it, but Mama was desperate. So she invites the, the, the pastor over, and he sits little Tommy down on the sofa and says, Tommy, do you know where Jesus is? Tommy was silent. He didn't know what to say. So sitting there in his silence, the pastor repeated the question, Tommy, do you know where Jesus is? Well, Tommy was sweating it at that point. He was wiggling in his seat, and he didn't say a word. And the pastor was sort of getting exasperated himself, and he said, Tommy, just answer me. Do you know where Jesus is? And at that point, Tommy ran out the door, was gone, and he went over to his friend's house, just totally distraught. He got to his buddy's house and ran up the, the stairs to his buddy's room, and his friend could tell that something was really wrong. And finally, he got Tommy calmed down enough, and he said, Tommy, Tommy, what's, what's wrong? And he said, you're not going to believe it. They've lost Jesus down at the church, and they're trying to blame me for it. <laughs> Where is Jesus? Probably all have asked that question at different times, but hopefully the, there will be an answer to that question and many others in today's sermon. This is the last sermon on your true identity, and today I hope to present what may be the most surprising identity message of all. The part of you that's not just about you, that's, that, that, that doesn't all hinge on you, that is made up of a, a, a connection to others and to God in a thousand ways, invisible and visible. The part of you that is something bigger and grander and more mysterious and more wonderful than you're probably aware of most of the time. The part of you that is united with all those who are sitting around you this morning. And also with those who you might never know around the globe. A mystical communion with God and other people that absolutely defines us as sacred. The final identity message is as unexpected as it is humbling we are the body of Christ. Now, I can't think of a message that is more radical, especially in a context of division and fragmentation and argument and disagreement. In a world full of divisions, our traditional communion liturgy reminds us of our unity. We, though we are many, form one body. Throughout the world, in every time, in every place, every single way that you can slice and dice us, every division that you can imagine succumbs to a greater unity that is out of God's grace and God's love and acceptance, out of the work of Jesus and in the ongoing work of the, the Spirit of God in people. We are the body of Christ. And that is our true identity, that we are the living, breathing, moving body of Jesus. Where is Jesus well, Paul would say, you are the body of Christ, and each one of us is a part of it. How could we seem so divided if we are, in fact, really united? Well, that question is not a new one. And if we think it is, it's probably helpful for us to realize that these kinds of divisions that we talk about and hear about and sort of fret over on social media 
are part of the, the brokenness of our world. And they're actually not, they're not new. In fact, the, uh, the, the letter that we found, find this beautiful scripture in this morning that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth was written in the context of a church that was divided. It was Paul's attempt to try to bring a, a, a divided and loosely knit group of people together under a united and unifying vision of who they really were. So very much like the church today, it was a way for them to discover their true identity. Paul was trying to help them understand who they were. Because they were a church divided. People couldn't agree on pretty much anything. On what to believe or who to follow. They argued over everything from marriage and sexual ethics to communion and how to worship. People were segregated out within the church because of their social class or their status. And so to a church deeply divided, Paul wrote a message of what actually unites us. And so we go to the beginning of the, the letter to Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1.10, to get this context. Paul writes, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, and this is where sort of this is funny, because like he, Paul starts naming names, right? Like, I've gotten word, and he starts telling who he's heard it from. Some from Chloe's household have informed me. I've always wondered, is Chloe like a gossip? Or is she like, you know, like the informer or somebody trustworthy? We may never know. Some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. And what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, Cephas or Peter. And still another says, I follow Christ. And then this is where it gets real. Paul says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Kind of using himself as the example. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I love how Eugene Peterson paraphrases this, this question. He, he, he says it this way. I ask you, has the Messiah been chopped up in little pieces so everybody can have a relic of his own? And of course the answer is no. To this divided, and church, divided church and divided world, Paul casts a vision for the unifying and boundary-destroying work of Jesus. He describes in the New Testament, and more broadly, uh, we get a picture of this thing that God has done that, that outdoes everything else that has been done. In fact, this identifier that cancels all other labels. There's no longer... Slave or free, Jew or Greek, conservative or liberal. Actually, that's not in there, but maybe it should be. There's a vision in Scripture of a group of people who find their identity not first in their race or their nationality or their politics or their social class or even their theological agreement. Instead, the Bible tells us that we find our true identity and who we are in Christ and in our being part of what he is doing in us and through us and in others. In this way, we discover our identity and our true significance, not from simply our individual achievements, but through the achievement of God through Jesus in us and in others and in the world. To help us understand that, Paul uses a metaphor. Uh, he, he compares us and our identity to that of a human body. And uh, if you've been around the church a, a while, this is, this is n probably nothing new to you. In fact, Paul uses this as a metaphor in 1 Corinthians. He also uses it in his letter to the Romans, which is interesting because that, that metaphor and that idea of who the church is and should be carries forth to a church that he, from a, you know, to Corinth is a church that he founded and knew all the ins and outs. And the church in Rome was a church that he wanted to go to and, and meet one day. And so he cast that same vision to them. But what's interesting about this metaphor, the metaphor of a human body, is that it's helpful in at least two ways. And I think in this metaphor, we find uh, enough power to discover our true identity and to discover what would bring healing to us and to our world. Turns out this, this idea is pretty genius because it brings together two things that don't often get put together. So this might be a place for you to take notes. I'm going to take, say two things that I think the body metaphor helps us understand that we might not. 
And the first is this. The body of Christ means that there's more than I in identity. Now, I, I almost, you know, was trying to think of how to say this. Like, there, you can't spell I with, with identity, but that kind of doesn't work because you can. Or, like, there's we, there's always we in identity, but that's not true either. So this is the way we're saying it. There, you're going to get the point. There's more than I in identity. Our culture emphasizes individuality. Everything that we celebrate is, has to do with personal greatness and individual achievement for the most part. But the gospel invites us to escape the burden of, of having to make life about me, of having to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. There's freedom in being part of something bigger and greater than any one of us could be on our own. Submission to God, it's been said, is giving up the terrible burden of having to be in control and in charge. In the human body, it can never be just about one part, can it? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. It's all united. And all those parts, though they might be different, come together in one. And it's interesting that that isn't something that it should be. It's, the, it's not that a body should be united. It's simply just how, is how it is. It's how, how that works. It's the way things are. There's this basic unity that's just simply part of the truth about who, who we are. Here in the body of Christ, there is a grace that's so powerful that it unites us over everything else that might divide us. As the body of Christ, we find a love big enough to invite and welcome and care for and include every kind of person imaginable. Now, we can be honest, and this is true. We may not like everybody. Not all personalities will click. We don't, aren't necessarily best friends with everybody in the church, and we might still get on each other's nerves. But we believe in a presence, a grace that is so powerful, so powerful that it enables me to let go of my need to have everything my way. A grace that is powerful enough to free me from my addiction to myself and my self-focus and my self-worship, the need to be with people who are only like me and ultimately to create others in my image. The body of Christ reminds me that it is not all about me. And it also reminds me that I don't have to carry the weight of the world on my shoulders. That the redemptive work of God is not only about me, but what God is doing in other people, making up for the gaps in my personality and my character, helping me overcome the, the challenges and sins of my own life. The body of Christ helps me realize that life is much more about we than we often realize. But that body metaphor also helps us in another way. It helps us understand something that, that actually doesn't always seem to go with what I just said. It may not be only about you, but it is some about you. You are still very important. In fact, in a body, this is also true. The parts might be uni united, but each part is important. And this is where Paul begins to describe how the body works. And bodies, very different and seemingly independent parts, are all brought together. Feet are important. So are eyes. So are elbows. So are ear hairs. And we don't know why, but apparently they grow in importance as we get older, right? <laughs> so I've heard. In each, part, in, in each part of the body, we may or may not understand why it's there or what what's it, it, its true purpose is. But this is the, the point that Paul wants to make to help us understand our true identity. And this is the second point. The body of Christ brings unity without conformity. Two very distinct things happen at the same time in a body, which is what makes this me metaphor so genius. That we're united and together, but also individualized and distinct at the same time. Listen, the church is not an assembly line sort of pumping out people who are all like one another. And our tendency often is to compare ourselves to one another, to think that uh, someone might be more important and, or maybe we're less important than others. But God's goal is not a collection of identical carbon copies of one another. God loves diversity. God's creative. And the more God is at work in people, the more different they become all at the same time that they become more united. Think about God's creation, all the diversity and creative energy that combines 
to be one very good universe. There are, in the United States, 2,500 different varieties of apple. And it's fall, so it's my mission to try every one. There are over 400,000 kinds of flowers, 20 different species of bees, and more than 60 species of trees, which is just an estimate. We could go on. But it helps us remember and sort of, again, push against the identity messages that often compel us to conform to be like someone else or to feel like we're not worth as much because we don't have something that someone else has. We're not like someone else. In the identity messages around us, the tendency is to run from differences or to see that if two things are different, then one must be better than the other. But in the church, we embrace difference, not because it's the politically correct thing to do, but it's because, because it's the holy thing to do. We affirm one another. Our first, first impulse is to value and to see the difference between us as an opportunity to learn and to grow and to be closer. Our first impulse is to listen rather than shout, to go to people who think differently than we do, to go to people who we're not sure we understand and try to understand, and to include people who don't look like us. The church as the body of Christ is one of, if not the only place in the whole world that is able to be more united even as it is more distinct. Does that make sense? Like every other group around us gathers around some affinity and it might be age, it might be experience, it might be some kind of love that we have. I am a 10-year member of 4-H, head, heart, hands and health committed to my community anybody else a 4-h person no i thought i was the only one no there's actually some in the room that was a great experience for me some of us have been part of different kinds of groups that bring great sort of purpose into our lives some of us still are we've been a part of sports teams that kind of bring a group of people together and there's nothing we love more than seeing that 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 sort of diverse group of people become one but in the body of Christ, something even more special happens. In fact, it's the only place, I would say, on the planet that unites us simply by God's work in us. On all these basic things about who we really are that actually make us kind of different from one another. And the great saints of the church, if you, if you want to kind of look at them or look at the, so the people we, we read in scripture, man, those, those people are all pretty different from one another. They become less like one another as God works in them, not more like one another. It's our tendency sort of naturally to enforce uniformity, to shame people into agreeing, to make fun of people who are different, to make people afraid to be different, to exclude people who don't fit in, to control people in subtle and not so subtle ways to get on board. It's our natural tendency to divide the world into us and them but that doesn't make sense in a body, does it? You divide a body in half and everybody suffers. Someone has said, I can draw a line in the name of Jesus between me and them, but every time I do, do it seems like Jesus is on the other side of the line. It's our natural tendency to divide up the world into us and them, but it takes grace and love. It takes a powerful grace and love to love real people in the name of Jesus. And yet when it happens, something miraculous happens. Something distinct and special. Why? Because we were never meant to live so segregated and isolated. We were never meant to fall under these smaller categories or these different groups and factions that divide us up that really are labels that aren't just, just, just not big enough. They're not big enough to contain who we really are. We weren't meant to lead separate and isolated lives. Or maybe to say it better, we actually aren't separate. We aren't, aren't isolated. And the fact that we think we are, the fact that we think we're divided, is really the problem. 
an anthropologist was working with a remote tribe in Africa and conducted a social science experiment with a, gr a group of children in the tribe. And what she decided to do, uh, this is sort of kind of a story that's known, uh, was to place a basket of fruit away from the children under a tree and then to draw a line and ask the children to, to get on one side of it and then sort of an American kind of, kind of a, a way of, of competing say this, that whoever gets to the fruit first wins. And, you know, it's the ready, set, go kind of thing. Now, I can imagine when I was a kid, or y'all kind of line up behind the line, I immediately, <clears throat> I'm pretty competitive. I immediately want to win. Um, and I can imagine uh, that's, that kind of is what the, the anthropologist thought would happen. Uh, and whoever wins gets to keep the fruit all for themselves. So what happens instead, she says, ready, set, go. And all the children just link hands and, and walk together and gather around the fruit and begin to share it. Trying to understand why they did that, the anthropologist began speaking to the children. And one of the children summed it up this way. A little girl said, how could only one of us be happy if all the others are sad? The Africans have a way of, of understanding our unity just simply as a part of our identity. They call it Ubuntu, and um, what that means sort of loosely translated is, I am because we are. It's their way of understanding something that maybe we ought to understand. This is what Desmond Tutu says. We believe that a person is a person through other persons. And every one of us actually knows that's true, right? You are who you are because of the people that have been around you for good or for bad. You've been shaped and formed by people from your earliest moments. And we all know that who we gather around really has a powerful effect on what we do and how we act. As I gather, uh, you know, the, a couple at a wedding often will say, you're here, you stand before God to unite and the two become one. And you're going to influ influence each other for the rest of your lives in the most powerful ways. So you better get that right. I also tell them to look around at their families. And it's, you know, it's in those sacred moments that we recognize the truth that's kind of always there. Look at your families, your friends. They have shaped you up to this point to bring you to the point where you are now. And now as the two become one, you're committing to shape one another and have the most powerful effect on another person imaginable. We're a person because of other persons. Desmond Tutu continues, that my hum we, we recognize that my humanity is caught up, bound up inextricably with yours. And that when I dehumanize you, I dehumanize myself. The solitary human being is a contradiction in terms. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist movement, said sort of famously, there is no holiness but social holiness, meaning that God works in us together to make us who we all were intended to be. That's what it means to be the body of Christ. It means that we realize our true identity in God's work in us all together and that our worth is seen in each other. We become more fully alive as we discover what it means to be in community and we discover our true identity as God works to heal us and others in his body. And that's why I think that metaphor works, right? That we're united, but we're different all at the same time. And that's the way bodies work. But Paul takes that a step further. He kind of uses that metaphor for a while. And then the sort, of, the, the sort of line at the end, the reveal at the end, is kind of the surprise. And it's, and it's kind of shocking and it's humbling at the same time. It's not only that, that we're a body, but he says we're the body of Jesus the body of Christ. And I don't know fully if I understand that. There's, there's some mystery to that. I'm not sure how that works. What does it mean to be the body of Christ, to be the heart and the hands and the feet and the presence of Jesus in the world? And what does it mean to be that with a bunch of ordinary people with all kinds of issues? Or, I mean, sort of bringing in a group of people together, acknowledging our brokenness. I mean, y'all are kind of messed up. I'm pretty together, but you all have, a, have some real issues. And yet this is, what, this is what the message is. You're the body of Christ, not ideal people, not other people, but you, 
me, us, amid all our divisions and all our, our issues. The Bible says that we are the body of Christ. But at some point, I think our faith in that truth will be tested. We'll be tempted to think that it's just better to give up on the whole idea that something that sacred is even possible in the messiness of the church and the messiness of people. Or certainly we'll be tempted to leave one body and try to find Jesus at work in another. The question that we've got to ask is, is there really enough grace to overcome the divisions and hurt and brokenness of our world so much that we become the living, breathing, acting presence of Jesus in the world? Is it possible that Jesus might live through us, through our unity and our diversity, all of it coming together, not just to be a body, but the body of Christ? Well, today I want to ask you to believe just that. To actually, to find your true identity in that message and in that hope. I invite you to join with Christians around the world in the resurrection hope of Jesus and in the mystical unity of the communion of the body of Christ. This is the message. We are the body of Christ. Catholic and Protestant, black and white, and brown, old and young, contemporary and traditional, King James Version and New International Version, mega church and little brown church in the veil, early service and late service and the 945 service, robed and incensed, or jeans and jokes. We together, though we are many, are the body of Christ. So something I think about our denominations, we kind of wrestled with that idea. What does it mean to be from different groups of people and uh, have different kinds of, of ways of doing church and, and different ways of worshiping. And that, that can be a source of division in the world. But it also can be a part of our unity, recognizing that people are different and uh, that we aren't, don't all have to be the same. And uh, churches may be sort of like personalities. Even individual churches are kind of like that. You gotta find the personality fit. Uh, at some point, you gotta jump in somewhere and no place is perfect. And one of the things we ne- try never to do is run down another denomination. Why? Because that's the body of Christ. That's the, the body of Jesus. And, and certainly other churches are not our church's competition. That doesn't make sense if we understand that we're all one body. But there are some things that should not divide us, right? Whether we kind of find ourselves in a, in a, in a certain kind of church um, or, or, uh, or another, there should be some things that never divide us, that we should work hard to overcome that tend to divide us. And certainly our race or our class, our experience, our nationality, those are, those are categories that are far too small for the body of Christ. Certainly worship style should not be something that divides us we should, we should appreciate people who worship differently than us. And certainly those categories that tend to cause people to go in separate directions ought to be the very things that cause us to join together in the glorious work of Jesus through people. We are one body, and in this there's a bond that enables us to cross boundaries, to get over our barriers, to build bridges, and stand with Jesus for the healing of our world. Where is Jesus? The pastor asked little Tommy. Where is Jesus? And the answer might be a little more simple than, than we tend to realize. This week, we gathered with our, a small group at our house, and we've been parts of different groups at different times, and I'm not going to share anything specific about that group uh, because that's not what we do. Um, but community is sort of like this thing that kind of, I've heard it says, sort of comes and goes and blows with the wind. You know, you just can't contain it, but when it happens, you should appreciate it. And uh, so we gathered with this, our, our group a, a few weeks ago, and I kind of had the benefit of, I know a lot of people in the church, and so I picked people that I like and uh, brought them together. And it's not, to- it's to- not totally true, especially if you're not in that group. No, I picked a few people that I don't like just to see if the whole thing would work, but... When we gather together you, when, when, in, in a new group like that, you kind of hope that people will gel. And there was just this thing that happened. And it, it was beautiful. And the second night, we began to tell our stories. 
and again, as a pastor, I kind of have the unique perspective of knowing a lot of people's stories. But to hear people share that and join together, it was like Jesus is, was there. And it was in the messiness and the, and the, the struggle not in the perfection and having it all right, not in gathering to say how much I've got it figured out and how somebody else doesn't, not in pointing out our differences, but in joining together in the hope that God can bring healing and hope into the lives of real people. Where's Jesus? He's simply where people come together in the hope that he's there with them. And that may, may never be ideal. It may never be perfect but it will always be beautiful and wonderful and redemptive. That's our hope. And it's the hope we gather in today with the church around the world. And uh, so let's prepare to join in, in Holy Communion today, which is our symbol, communion literally, of our unity with all kinds of different people in all kinds of different places, with all kinds of different challenges and opportunities. We gather with the church that is persecuted we're, we gather with a church that speaks all kinds of different languages and yet points to the same Lord. We gather with a church that has the same hope and ultimately the same mission to be agents of Jesus in the world. And we find our identity with them in this thing that unites us over all that might divide us. If you would gather in that hope, then let's, let's prepare to, to join together in communion. And today we're going to do this um, and together uh, also as well as a form of our unity. I'm going to lead us in a little bit fuller version of the liturgy, and it'll be on the screen. And uh, I'll invite you to, to, uh, to join in at different parts, and I'll lead us and I'll tell you where those are. So as we uh, find those words on the screen, yours will be underlined, and, uh, and I will lead us. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You have made from one every nation and every tribe to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. He commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today his family and all the world joins together at his holy table. On the night in which he gave himself for up, up for us, he, gave, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit, God, on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. May they be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Renew our communion with your church, our unity throughout the world, and strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully to your powerful name. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again in final victory and we all join together at his heavenly banquet through your son, Jesus Christ, 
and your holy church and through your Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever.